Hello. Thank you very much for attending the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathies educational program on hereditary neuropathies and the benefits of genetic testing. This program is generously sponsored by Alnylam Pharmaceuticals. My name is Lindsay Colbert, and I'm the Executive Director of the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy. Once again, I thank you for trusting us to deliver quality resources to your doorstep, and thank you so much for being a part of our organization. Joining me today are two experts in today's programmatic topics. Dr. Amanda Peltier is a neurologist and neuromuscular professor of neurology at Vanderbilt University. Emily Brown is a patient support professional and genetic counselor based out of Johns Hopkins Hospital. I thank both of our experts for joining us today and taking time to explain hereditary neuropathies and genetic testing to our group. Before we get started, just a few small housekeeping items. First, we are recording this webinar and we will upload the presentation along with the materials that are being referenced on the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathies website for your future viewing pleasure. Second, we will be holding a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. We ask that all participants who are joining us live today to submit any relevant questions via the questions box on your dashboard. Please keep your questions general in nature and topic specific, as we will not be able to address anything that is personalized medical question or one that does not cover hereditary neuropathies or genetic testing. And lastly, anyone having difficulties with their audio for the live program should consider dialing in by phone. Those instructions are included in your registration email. Now, without further ado, I'm pleased to both welcome and pass the virtual microphone over to Dr. Peltier to begin her presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Peltier. Hi, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about hereditary neuropathies and genetics and talk about where uh, TTR and amyloidosis also fits into that picture. So let <clears throat> me... Uh, if you want to give me slide control or advance the slide. Or just go ahead and advance the slide. That probably might be simpler. All right, so inherited neuropathies, we <clears throat> are, 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 are neuropathies that are typically caused by single gene mutation or gene deletion or a duplication of a gene. Now, another rare uh, thing that doesn't exist as often in neuropathy are what's called expanded repeats, where the same DNA segment is repeated over and over and over, which basically screws up the gene and causes essentially garbage in the gene. Um, but that is, uh, I'm not gonna talk about that today since it's not really pertinent to most of the neuropathies we're talking about. Now, we think that about 7% of all neuropathies are inherited. That understanding is changing as we do more genetic testing on patients. And part of that growing change is that it used to be that genetic testing was fairly expensive, time consuming and cumbersome. And so we didn't do it very often. And especially in the past where we didn't have specific genetic treatments, or treatments for people with genetic disorders, generally, uh, we actually had a neurologist at our institution who used to tell patients, don't bother, it's not worth your time or your money. <clears throat> now, obviously, a lot has changed and a lot continues to change. So we now encourage people to do genetic testing. And the field of genetic testing has incredibly changed. If you recall, it took them like 10 years to sequence the entire human genome <clears throat> and now we can do it in literally days. So, <clears throat> and also obviously at a much fraction of the cost as we have more technology. So inherited neuropathies per se, I suspect we will have a higher percentage of the population as we get more information on genetics in the future. So inherited neuropathies affect different motor fibers sensory fibers or autonomic fibers. So they have different combinations depending on the gene. And so then patients can have different symptoms or different signs of neuropathy on exam. And the concept of inherited neuropathy was first described in the literature 
by three guys, Jean Charcot, Pierre Marie, who are from Paris, France, and Howard Tooth, who is an English neurologist. And they described in 1886 what we now uh, understand to be uh, the most common inherited neuropathy, which is a PMP22 gene duplication. And, uh, and so it was originally called Charcot-Marie Tooth Neuropathy. And so many patients may have heard that name and wonder, well, why do we call it Charcot-Marie Tooth? And then a lot of people have abbreviated over time to CMT. And then hereditary amyloidosis is in a slightly different category, and I'll explain that in a bit, it was described in 1952 by Dr. Andrade in Portugal. Now, and that understanding has grown significantly too, as that was originally thought to be specific to Portugal, and was originally actually called Portuguese amyloidosis, and is now understood to be a worldwide disorder. So, next slide. So, inherited disorders can be passed down in different ways, and it depends on the gene and how the gene functions. So if you recall, we all have two copies of each gene with the exception of, for men, there are not two X chromosomes, there's one X chromosome and a Y chromosome. So a gene that's autosomal dominant means that it only takes one copy of the gene to cause the disease. And so therefore, if you have a parent with the disease, um, you have a 50-50 chance of getting that basically bad copy of that gene from your parent. Now, obviously, if you have two parents who have the same gene, then you're, you know, the chances may be a little different. But generally, you can think of it as you know, flipping a coin. Now, this is all by chance. So you can have a family where that coin flip means that three out of four kids have the gene or it could be one out of four kids have the gene, or exactly half, as you would expect, you know, by statistics. Now, but but the idea is, is that you have a much higher chance of, of having the gene passed on in your family. An osomal recessive gene is a gene that one copy alone is not sufficient to cause disease typically. And so we typically expect two mutations, so one in each chromosome, you know, that uh, <clears throat> to cause the disease. So in that case, unless the parents are related or just by chance happen to have the same gene, you know, most of the time you're not going to see uh, many um, parent-children uh, uh, combinations, what you'll typically see is you'll have parents have one or several children with that particular disorder, and that's it. And it may appear like it's appearing out of nowhere because uh, unless you have a family where there's been some intermarrying going on, that you, or you have a community where that gene has a high prevalence in the community, you may not see that many people in your family with it. Um, so. So that's uh, the second type of disorder. The third type of disorder is called X-linked. And so most disorders that are X-linked, so the problem is the, the gene is on the X chromosome. And so therefore a guy by definition cannot pass it on to his son because he's not given his X chromosome to his son, he's giving his Y chromosome to his son. And so, and, and like, the autosomal, which is what we call all the other chromosomes except for the sex chromosomes or autosomes, um, uh, it can be either dominant, meaning it takes only one copy to cause disease, and in that case, all the women in the family would be severely affected, or it can be recessive, meaning that most of the women will not have symptoms, but they'll just simply pass it on. And a lot of times it's probably uh, kind of in between the two. So next. Uh, Next slide, please. And if you look over all the mutations that cause inherited neuropathies, the by far most common is a duplication in the PMP22 gene, meaning that on one chromosome, that gene got duplicated. So that means that gene, which is very important for the myelin, which is the insulation around our nerves that helps our nerves conduct fast and conduct efficiently, 
does not work well. So then what, mean, what that means in real life is that those nerves then degenerate over time and don't connect well. And patients can have problems with both motor and sensory issues. And so if you look over all mutations, that is the, by far the most common mutation is this PMP22 duplication. Um, now, a few patients will actually have a deletion where they're missing a copy of their PMP22 gene. And those patients show up a little bit differently because they can have different what we call entrapment syndromes where they can get a carpal tunnel or they can get an ulnar nerve pinch at the elbow or <clears throat> other gene, other nerves that look like they have like one nerve being picked off here and there, or they can look like they have an uh, overall neuropathy, meaning all the nerves are affected uh, to some degree. The other common gene is GJB1, which is X-linked, and the other name for that gene is Conexin, so it affects mostly men, although we've seen some women who have uh, symptoms of that particular disorder, although they typically tend not to be as um, severely affected as the men with that disorder. And then MPZ is another gene like PMP22, which affects the myelin, and then MFN2, which is myelofusion, is a gene that's ex passed on as autosomal uh, dominant, but is what we call an exonal mutation, meaning it affects the actual nerve, not the nerve axon, not the actual surrounding myelin. And part of the reason why we have such weird nomenclature for these different disorders is because neurologists, when they first discovered all these, would describe them based on what they looked like in the clinic and also what they looked like in the EMG lab. So when you did nerve test on these patients, the next slide, um, you would look at their motor nerves and sensory nerves with nerve connection testing in the EMG lab. Um, and then the other nerve that is not as well measured, at least not for a long time, were the small non-myelinated sensory nerves and autonomic nerves. So, <clears throat> so the motor nerves, like I said, are the nerves that go to muscle. So when they're affected, that's what causes weakness, that's what causes atrophy. The sensory nerves that are large and myelinated cause loss of touch, cause loss of um, knowing kind of where you are, so people have problems with their balance, they really have problems walking on uneven ground or uh, keeping their balance with their eyes closed. Whereas patients who have small non-myelinated like sensory fibers that are in the skin um, that convey pain and temperature um, are typically not affected in quote myelinated fiber disorders. Um, to the same degree, and they also don't have all the autonomic problems because those nerves are typically not affected. And the autonomic nerves are the nerves that go to your heart, to your sweat glands, to your organs, to your gut, um, that control all those kind of automatic functions that we don't really think about per se. And, uh, and so, so each different mutation has a wide variety of different uh, nerves that it affects. Um, and that's how part of how we used to, uh, uh, to classify these mutations. Next slide. And also by their inheritance pattern. Um, and so when they first came up with the inheritance pattern for, quote, CMT neuropathies, they described the PMP22 de deletions and the MP0 or protein 0 uh, all in CMT1 because when they brought those patients to the lab, because their myelin was so screwed up, the conduction velocity or how fast the nerve impulse from the time you stimulate the nerve with electricity to the time you would pick it up on a little recording would literally be 10 to 20 meters per second. And to give you an idea, like normal is about 50 meters per second. So it'd be a fraction of the speed. And so they said, okay, all the people who have that uh, presentation who started having symptoms in their in childhood or their teens, we're going to call them CMT1. They are autosomal dominant, meaning that it only took one copy, one bad copy to cause the disorder. And then CM2, they said, okay, those are the patients who have similar features, but we think it's the axon involved because when we test those people in the lab, 
if we can get a response, the response is about as fast as it usually is, but some, a lot of times the response is reduced because we think the axon is impaired, the actual nerve impulse is repaired. So we don't get that much, you know, so we're going to call those people CMT2. And then this is where our understanding of genetics didn't kind of come about because there used to be a CMT3, which was patients who presented as babies with similar features and had a more severe type. And then when they actually found genetics uh, testing and that came about, they realized that actually the CMT3 patients um, had the exact same gene mutations as CMT1 patients. They just happened to present earlier for some reason. So that's why we don't really use CMT3 anymore. And then CMT4 are autosomal recessive genes with which there's a certain category. And then CMTX, which I kind of talked about. Now CMTX is interesting because they kind of have a mismatch of features. They also have motor, they also have large sensory features, but they have this kind of, they're in the middle where their slowing of their nerve connections are about 25 to 35 compared to the really slow CMT1 and the not so slow CMT2. Um, so those patients generally are pretty, um, you know, you have a pretty good guess that that's what it's gonna be, um, especially since they tend to be mostly male. And then there's a separate group of disease disorders called hereditary sensory and autonomic neuropathies which are typically almost all recessive that mainly affect those small non-myelinated fibers. And they can present in a various ways. They can present with either a painful neuropathy or what we call erythromalgia, where your hands and feet get super hot, bright red and sensitive, or they can present with a complete absence of pain. And they actually can have multiple amputations because they don't feel anything, they don't feel injury, and so they keep injuring themselves. Uh, and then, of course, there's the hereditary amyloidosis category. And that group of disorders has classically not been included in, quote, CMT neuropathy because not only does it affect the genes, which is the main target of the CMT neuropathies, but it also affects other organs. Um, and it used to be, and then the variant that we now understand was a valine switch to methionine at the 30th position, so that's why we call it a V30M, the most common mutation worldwide that was originally described by Dr. Andrade in Portugal. We now know that there's multiple other mutations and affects many other fibers, but a lot of the core features of what they described remain, meaning that a lot of patients get carpal tunnel, Almost actually, almost everybody gets carpal tunnel syndrome. A lot of people can have back problems because that abnormal protein gets stuck in ligaments as well as nerves and then affects the heart, can affect the kidneys and other organs. Uh, so it can cause a whole lot of different symptoms. And because it can affect those small autonomic nerves as well, a lot of these patients can also have a lot of autonomic problems. They can have a lot of diarrhea or constipation or both or um, lightheadedness, their blood pressure drops when they stand up, things like that. So uh, next slide. And so one of the things that we've discovered over time is that the TTR transthyretin gene, which is a gene actually the name tells you what it does. The gene transports thyroid hormone or, you know, and retin or retin-A and it uh, <clears throat> there's over 150 different mutations uh, in that particular gene. And previously, depending on who the patient showed up to first, they were characterized as either, quote, neurologic or cardiac. Now, interestingly, if you look, the, the mutations that are most common in the United States, which is B122I, uh, which is common, which originated in West Africa, which we'll get to T60A, uh, which is uh, originated in Ireland, are very uh, cardiac manifestations, whereas they have neuropathy, but they also have pretty significant heart disease. And so a lot of those patients, especially the B122I patients, would show up to cardiologists first when they basically had heart failure and they would get short of breath and they couldn't breathe and they couldn't exercise. Um, 
And so, and as we study these mutations more, I think we understand that all the mutations tend to cause both nerve and heart damage. It's just a matter of who they show up to and at what point in their uh, disease course they show up. But almost all of them have the shared characteristic of patients having carpal tunnel pretty significantly before they develop either nerve or heart problems. So next slide. Now the confusing thing about transthyretin is that as opposed to a gene mutation, um, a, that gene mutation causes what we call toxic gain of function, meaning that the gene mutation makes the protein more likely to fall apart. So normally transthyretin exists as four proteins stuck together in a tetramer. And then when those proteins fall apart, and they basically twist into what's called this amyloid fibril. That fibril, the body can't get rid of. It just gets stuck there, and the body has a hard time of uh, getting rid of it, and then it causes this basically sticky goo that um, impairs function. Next slide. And so there's different, you know, disease targets of trying to keep those proteins together, um, which are called stabilizers, and then and then silencing the gene, you know, has become a new treatment option. But that, like I said, the difference between the amyloidosis neuropathies and the inherited neuropathies is that there's a whole lot of other organs that it affects, not just the nerves. And so, and obviously the big concern is that when it affects the heart and other issues, so literally patients used to have a prognosis of about seven to 10 years from the time that they presented to the doctor. Uh, next slide. And then if you actually looked at the slide in the heart or the kidneys or the GI tract, you would see, like I said, the sticky pink stuff. Um, now, the problem we have in neurology is that because it tends to be very patchy and you're only getting a tiny little segment if you do a nerve biopsy, it's not very sensitive in picking up nerves. So when people you know, sometimes people's insurance companies will require us to do biopsies or ask us to do biopsies, but the problem we have is sometimes those biopsies aren't very good because you're only getting a small segment of tissue and it may just happen not to pick up the area where the amyloid is sitting. Next slide. So, so TTR, those mutations, um, there's this big uh, database called TAUS that <clears throat> is funded by Pfizer, I believe. And, uh, and they actually are, are basically collecting data from all over the world, from researchers and doctors all over the world. And so the most common mutations, like I said, um, happen to be B122I, which originally uh, originated in West Africa and, uh, um, and unfortunately was imported over with the slave trade to the United States. So a lot of African-Americans have that particular mutation. And then the other common mutation originated in Ireland uh, and the Scots who emigrated to Ireland then emigrated to the United States and often uh, emigrated to Appalachia and like Eastern Tennessee. Uh, a lot of them tend to carry that particular mutation. So that's the most second most common is a T60A or T80A mutation. Uh, next slide. So, um, and, and the reason why these are important is that these mutations now have genetic, the TTR mutations now have genetic treatments available that can really prevent the disease from getting worse over time which is a huge benefit to patients. Now, as far as the other inherited neuropathies, there is a huge amount of research going on. So there are genetic treatments that are being tested in animal models for PMP22 and other gene mutations. And so, whereas before we used to say, ah, it doesn't matter. Now we are really advocating for patients who have neuropathy to get genetic testing to make sure that we A, are not missing a treatable form like TTR, but also so they know what gene they have so that as other gene treatments come online, we can also talk about what that uh, um, looks like. Now, the one thing I will talk about, which I didn't really cover gene testing, which 
um, Emily is going to talk about in a second, is that uh, you know depending on your institution, it might be the neurologist who talks to you about genetic testing, it might be a cardiologist, they might defer it to a genetics expert or a genetics counselor. Um, but one of the problems with genetic testing is two issues. One is called penetrance, meaning that if you have a mutation, when and if do you have symptoms? Because a gene that's, quote, incompletely penetrant, meaning that not everybody who carries the mutation has symptoms, patients might have the gene but might not end up having a whole lot of problems with it. They might not develop symptoms until they're 80 or might not develop symptoms at all. Now, a lot of the TTR mutations were considered um, relatively highly penetrant, but then some of the mutations like B122I were not considered to be highly penetrant, but that also goes along with, well, how much do we understand and how much have we actually evaluated patients and their families for signs and symptoms of the disease? And so our estimation of penetrance is and prevalence is changing. Um, as far as, and when I say prevalence, meaning how many people in your community by chance carry a copy of that gene, that gene mutation. And then the other issue that you come up with on genetic testing is called variants of uncertain significance, where basically you have certain mutations that are recognized, have been described in patients and families that we know are problematic, that we know cause disease. And then you can have a change in a DNA sequence that nobody knows what to do with. It's not been seen before. And those are called variants of uncertain significance. Now, um, and this is where genetic counseling and genetics expert kind of be helpful because, and also knowing kind of what that gene is. So if you do a huge panel of gene tests, it's possible that by chance you may carry a slightly different sequence and it'll come back on your gene testing as quote variants. So uh, we'll talk about that with our next speaker, um, but it's also important then to get more information because those may be nothing or it may be something. And those are a little bit of the trickiness of doing genetic testing. So with that, I will hand it over to Emily, our genetics counselor. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Peltier. Um, and so I'm going to be talking the second part of the webinar about genetic testing and the role of a genetic counselor within the scope of hereditary neuropathy. Might have to have you advance my slides. Oh, here are my disclosures. Next slide. All right, so starting with the genetic counseling piece. Next slide. Okay, so a genetic counselor is typically someone who has a master's degree in genetic counseling and then has gone on to pass their board exam. And really what their role is, is to talk not only about the science of the genetics and what that means for you, but also talking about how that relates to family members, what is the risk other people in the family might have a similar condition, providing you with information on support recess, resources or um, information on how to, you know, adjust to these diagnoses or risks um, as we'll go through genetic testing can really be affect not only yourself, but also affect your family. And so just helping patients walk through that process. Next slide. So whenever I tell people uh, I'm a genetic counselor, I often get questions about what that actually means. And someone will say, oh, do you help people make babies or work in the prenatal field? Um, so go ahead and advance it. We do not clone people. Um, so that's not something we do. And while there are genetic counselors who work specifically in prenatal with parents who are expecting, we don't help create designer babies. So we're not helping people select the genes to make their babies the smartest, the fastest. You know, the prenatal counselors really work to help people maybe understand if their baby already 
if thought to have a genetic condition or the risk their baby might inherit a genetic condition based on the family history. And there is genetic testing that can go into that, but it's not focused on creating those designer babies. Next slide. Um, so I think talking with a genetic counselor or a provider who's well-versed in genetics and genetic testing is important because the test itself is much more than a simple blood test or cheek swab. Um, it impacts family members. You know, if you test positive for a genetic condition as Dr. Peltier went over, that could mean other people in the family also are at risk. And how do you talk to people, you know, family members about that? How do you share this information? It can have financial implications. So not even thinking of the cost of the test itself, but it can impact your ability to get life insurance or long-term care insurance in the future. And depending on your profession, potentially could impact that as well. And then mental health implications. So people can have all sorts of reactions to genetic testing. And even patients that maybe their family member has the condition and they do the genetic test to see they're at, if they're at risk and they test negative, sometimes people can experience survivor's guilt or feel bad that they didn't test positive. They don't have that same condition that's seen in other family members. Um, so sometimes it's helpful to kind of process the results and process what that means. Next slide. You can really see a genetic counselor at any point in your healthcare journey. Um, it can be done pre-test. Ideally, I would say it's done pre-test and post-test, but that's not always the case due to a variety of reasons. So pre-test, before you do a genetic test, you know, it's helped to explore what the test would cover, what it's not going to tell you, how that would impact your own medical care, um, the types of results you can expect to get back, and just help you decide if you want to proceed. We, it's also not uncommon for a genetic counselor to see someone after they've had genetic testing. So maybe the neurologist orders the genetic test and it comes back with one of those variants of uncertain significance or VUSs. And um, the neurologist refers to get some more genetics expertise. Um, that's not uncommon time. Or if you just have more questions about the results, um, always happy to see people about that or talking through how to talk with family members. And then, as I mentioned, some people do see a genetic counselor preconception or in that prenatal period to talk about the risk for kids. Next slide. One of the important pieces to know when you're thinking about genetic testing and the reason I recommend meeting with a healthcare professional that's has expertise in genetics is that not all genetic tests are created equal. And so when thinking or selecting a test, what needs to be considered or what are the genes tested? Is it looking at all the genes that might be implicated or might be needed to see if there's a mutation in them? What type of technology is being used? Is it sequencing the whole gene or reading that entire gene as if it's a sentence? Is it just looking at small parts of the gene? Um, and not all tests can detect all types of mutations. So that can be important depending on the specific condition that's suspected. Um, interpreting, as um, Dr. Peltier mentioned, it can be tricky to interpret the results. Is the lab familiar with hereditary neuropathies? Do they have experts interpreting these results? Um, and then thinking about the accuracy. So usually from a clinical genetic test, if it's positive or negative, in terms of actually seeing that variant or that mutation, that's very accurate. You don't need to repeat it. But where it becomes challenging is if you instead of doing a clinical test, did direct-to-consumer testing like 23andMe, and that tends to be less accurate. Next slide. Okay, so just a little bit more about 23andMe and the other direct-to-consumer testing that's out there because I know this is a common um, way people try to access genetic testing. 23andMe does look at a few neurological conditions. You know, it looks at TTR, amyloidosis, but it only looks at the three most common mutations. So a negative result in that 
for 23andMe is not a negative result for hereditary amyloidosis. It's just those three mutations, not the whole gene. Looks at other conditions like Parkinson's and then does carrier testing to see if you have one mutation in a recessive condition where you typically need those two mutations, but it's not diagnostic itself for those recessive conditions. Um, so typically this is not the best way to go. It's much better to meet with someone and have clinical grade genetic testing. Next slide. Um, the other limitation is their technology tends to just do what we call genotyping. So again, if you think of the gene as a sentence, it's just picking out a couple letters within that sentence to look at instead of reading the whole sentence. Um, and if you can think of it almost as a picture, you'll see down here, um, there's a picture of fish. And so the genotyping is giving you part of that picture. But if you went ahead and did full sequencing, go ahead and advance it, um, you would see the full picture and get a lot more information and see that, oh, the fish, fish are actually in danger. There's an eagle in the picture. Um, and so a negative result with direct-to-consumer testing is rarely true negative. And even on the 23andMe website, it says not to use any of that data for medical management recommendations or decisions. We always repeat that testing. Go ahead and next slide. Um, so ha as has been mentioned, the interpretation of genetic test results can be tricky. It's not always black and white. So it's not always oh, positive or negative. Often it can be a spectrum where there are some variants or genetic changes in the gene that get put in the middle as kind of a gray zone where we don't know is that variation really causing someone's neuropathy or is it just a harmless variation that someone just happened to have and we've never seen it before, but it doesn't actually cause disease. We all have changes in our genes. That's what makes us unique. Majority of these changes are harmless, but some can cause health conditions like neuropathies. And so if we can't tell one way or the other, there's not enough research or data out there, the variant gets classified as uncertain. Um, with the hope that as we do more information or do more research and get more information, in the future we'll be able to say, oh yes, this is actually the cause, or no. Nope, Actually, it's not. Um, and even, you know, genetic test interpretation can change over time. So even a positive result from 20 years ago sometimes does get reclassified. And that's just another reason to really work with a genetics professional to get a sense of, you know, how certain are we of these results. Um, neurologists often are very good with this, uh, but otherwise genetic counselors as well. Go ahead to the next slide. And this slide is just talking through the idea of how common variants of uncertain significance are for neuropathy testing. And we shorthand is called a VUS. Um, and this data came from a publication that looked at 25,000 patients with neuropathy. Um, and it's hard to see, but on the bottom axis, you can see that all, up to 800 VUSs were reported in some of these genes, and that's in the gray, the gray bars. And then the red bars are the ones that get got reinterpreted to pathogenic, meaning disease causing, or harmless, called benign, um, over over time. And so, really, what I wanted to show is just it can be quite common to get some of these ambiguous or uncertain results, especially if you're having a large panel that's looking at a couple hundred genes. It's quite typical to see a VUS come back. Okay. Next slide. So from a financial perspective, and I think this is a really key point when you're considering genetic testing, and it's something I often get asked about, there is a law called GINA, or the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, that protects against most employers and um, health insurances from using genetic information. So they can't deny you employment or raise your rates for your health insurance. 
major kind of exemptions to that are the military, federal employees, they have their own separate law outside of GINA, or small employers with less than 15 employees. Uh, but another big caveat with this law is it doesn't include life insurance or long-term care insurance. So potentially, if you were to go open a new, say, long-term care insurance policy, they could ask if you've ever done genetic testing and use that information to determine coverage. It doesn't affect any policies you already have in place, or if you get life insurance through your employer, that wouldn't be affected. Um, it's these private policies. Some patients will go ahead and get life insurance, for example, before doing the genetic testing. Um, now, I will say it does just in general depend on your family history and your own medical history. So if you're having a lot of neuropathy and other signs and symptoms of one of these conditions, that in itself may make it difficult to get life insurance and long-term care insurance. But where I think this can be really key is with family member testing. So say your sister is unaffected, doesn't have any symptoms, and wants to do testing for the condition running in the family, it might be ideal for her to get life insurance or long-term care insurance first. Next slide. So from a privacy perspective, what, you know, what happens with the genetic data. I think with the Golden State State Killer case, this really came to the public's forefront, front of mind, because, you know, who has access to genetic information? In general, most direct-to-consumer companies like 23andMe or Ancestry own the genetic data. So when you send in your sample, they now own that information and they're allowed to sell that to third parties. Um, for research purposes, often pharmaceutical companies are interested in that data, what have you. Um, however, from a medical and clinical lab perspective, most, if not all of them, will not sell or disclose your data without your explicit consent. Um, now that isn't to say that they don't hold on to the data, so they often will retain a copy of your results. It's, most states legally require that for a certain amount of time, just with any medical test. Um, but also, especially for those variants of uncertain significance, this allows the lab to go back and say, oh, we saw 20 patients with this variant, and now we know it's disease causing. We can let their providers know, let the patients know, and they can get more accurate medical care based on that. So it is actually very beneficial that they keep that information. And I will say most clinical labs do participate in a federally funded program through the NIH called ClinVar, which is a national wide database that just uploads anonymous variant or mutation specific data to help us understand you know, has anyone else seen this variant? Help clinicians across the country make medical decisions and understand the genetics better. But it's all anonymous and it's not your full DNA sequence or genetic sequence, it's just that specific variant. Next slide. All right, so I wanted to go through just a few nuts and bolts about how do we actually do the genetic testing and insurance coverage in that piece. Next slide. Okay, so typically now genetic testing is often done by a cheek swab called a buckle swab, which is what this picture is showing. And it's just like a big Q-tip that you brush on the inside of your cheek. Um, but it can also be done by blood or saliva where you spit into a tube. Many labs now will even send the kits directly to your house, which is great in the age of telemedicine. I can see a patient remotely and just have the lab ship it out to them. It depends on the specific test your provider is ordering. Often results are available about four weeks, but it, it really is lab and test dependent. Next slide. Okay, so I'm sure people are wondering about insurance coverage and this is very complex and I'm probably not going to be able to answer this to everyone's satisfaction but it is very dependent on your insurance, whether it's commercial insurance like Cigna, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, versus Medicare or Medicaid. 
it's all dependent on that um, and then dependent on the specific policies the specific indication or reason why you're having the genetic testing if you're interested in genetic counseling typically this will be covered by at least most private insurances um, and the specific billing cpt code which is what you would call your insurance to say do you cover this is 96040. That's what most institutions and hospitals use, um, but I would always clarify that with the, the provider first. And then for the actual genetic test, this is where it gets really complex. Sometimes during the visit, the pre-test visit, um, we can do what's called a benefits investigation and know upfront what the estimated cost is. That's lab dependent. Um, sometimes and often labs will have pa patient financial assistance programs that a lot of genetic test result or test patients getting genetic testing will qualify for to help reduce the cost. There are a couple of programs sponsored by Alnylam and other pharmaceutical companies that will cover the cost of genetic testing specifically for amyloidosis or other specific conditions, um, and they'll also cover the cost of genetic counseling. So it, it's just very complex and very patient specific. Next slide. Okay. In terms of finding access to a genetic counselor, I know not everyone in the country has easy access. There's you know, areas of the country that have very few genetic counselors and they are often seeing prenatal or cancer patients. But one of the good things that came out of the pandemic is now there's a lot more telemedicine options available for genetic counseling. So there are two companies that offer tele, just exclusive telemedicine appointments called informed DNA or genome medical, but also often a lot of the major institutions potentially in your area or, you know, a few hours away offer genetic counseling by telemedicine. And you can go to this website, findageneticcounselor.nsgc.org and look by region, by do you want in-person or telemedicine, by what specialty you want and see what's available. Next slide. Uh, and those are just some references. And so I'll just open it up now for, for Lindsay to come back on and do some Q&A. Yeah, hi everyone. And thank you so much, Emily. Dr. Peltier, I welcome you to, to join us back in as well during the Q&A. Um, we do have a lot of questions that came in during this session, um, a few of which were already addressed. Um, so again, for anyone that needs to reference the slides or the recording, this will get uploaded onto the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathies website within the next day or two. Um, but obviously, we can also answer any questions as a follow-up um, as well. Um, so one of the questions is from a patient who says, look, you know, I, I swear I have inherited neuropathy, but all of my tests are negative but now I'm seeing my children have some signs and symptoms of it. What should I do about this information now? I'm not sure which one might be best to answer this question. So, so one of the downsides to genetic testing is the genetic test only covers a certain panel of genes typically. So there are certain panels that might cover 90 genes, like Vanderbilt came out with a panel of 192 genes, um, or you can do all of the genes. There are hundreds of gene mutations that we know cause inherited neuropathy. So what we typically recommend to people that if they've had negative genetic testing, one is to know, like talk to the neurologist or whoever ordered the test about how many genes were covered in that quote test, because if it was a small number of genes, the next step might logically be a bigger panel. If it was already a big panel to begin with, the next step might make sense to talk to geneticists about doing whole exome sequencing. And then if they really think that their children are symptomatic, you know, then it's sometimes doing kind of all the genes. So the downside to doing all the genes as the more genes you test, the more variants you're gonna find. 
Um, so that's where it's important to look at that connection between the way um, of what symptoms somebody has versus what the sequence is. And that's where I think talking to a genetic specialist. Um, so we typically at, at Vanderbilt would refer them to our genetics department to handle like testing family members and then also involve genetic counseling to also test about, you know, talk about implications for that. But that's where I typically start is first look at what panel was done and then kind of make a decision with the patient um, what makes sense to, for the next step. And I'll just add that even a negative test doesn't rule out that it's genetic. We don't know all the genetic causes. So you right. might have had the most extensive testing we can offer, and it's just not good enough yet to find it. You're still learning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. No, that's helpful information. Um, and obviously, this program is specific to hereditary inherited neuropathies, but do you recommend anyone else with, let's say, idiopathic neuropathies or other types of sensory neuropathies, should they consider getting genetic tests as well to either rule things in or out, or is that not um, advised? I personally think it depends on what kind of neuropathy they have and kind of the likelihood of genetic abnormalities. And also, it depends too on how much have they looked at other causes and kind of the age of the person um, makes a big difference. So if somebody is under the age of 20, then the chance of it being what I what I would call acquired, meaning oh you've got diabetes, oh you've got you know uh, abnormal blood protein called a monoclonal homopathy, oh you have a vitamin deficiency, all those types of things tend to accumulate as we get older. So the older we are. <clears throat> the more likely something is going to be acquired is going to be higher. That being said, that's not, you know, does not mean that genetic testing is zero. So if you've been a neurologist, and I often do this with my patients, if they've been tested for everything else that I can think of that makes sense, I'll talk to them about the pros and cons of genetic testing because we have had patients where we found a genetic abnormality. It also depends on the type of neuropathy people are having. So people who have a lot of weakness with their neuropathy are more likely to have a genetic mutation when we're not as good or we have not been as good recognizing those more sensory neuropathies. Um, so in my practice, when I see patients who have a primarily sensory neuropathy, the chance that we find an answer for them, unfortunately, just because of where we are medically, is a lot lower. So, so that also has to be factored in. But, um, <clears throat> you know, so a lot of it depends on the type of neuropathy people have and kind of the age that they have. You know, I do genetic testing for pretty much anyone under the age of 30 because I'm like, yeah, that's, you know, unless they have obvious, you know, something, um, it's very, you know, I generally tend to be more aggressive in younger patients. Um, so, yeah. So we've had several patients during this program talk about when should they get retested. So obviously, new genetic mutations are being discovered all the time, especially with Charcot Marie Tooth. Um, so when should they consider getting retested? When should they compare results from previous years or decades? Um, how should patients navigate kind of the timing of that? <clears throat> I can <laughs> talk about that because you probably run into that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so typically my rule of thumb is for like a variant of uncertain significance. And you're wondering about, are, is there new information about that every few years? It's, you know, ask your provider, is there any new information? Sometimes the labs don't automatically update the reports, and so we don't know until we specifically ask. Um, okay. So it is good to revisit that. Um, and it just depends, you know, what was your original testing? If it was from 10 years ago, probably worth updating it unless something definitive was found. Or similarly, if, if a patient is having any progression in the disease, would that be another kind of indicator? Hey, let's just check back in. Yeah, depending on if that progression kind of fits with what we would expect or if it's 
new symptoms and the testing previously was negative, that Got can it. be a helpful time. Okay. Um, so another um, another patient had been previously diagnosed with a hereditary neuropathy and also then recently had a surgery for carpal tunnel, but the recovery from that has been slow and painful. So is there any relationship to other forms or degrees of, of neuropathies or you know, carpal tunnel as well? Dr. Peltier, you're, you're nodding your heads a little bit, so I'm gonna maybe pass the mic over to you on this one. Yeah, so um, we often talk about that, I mean, I'm gonna put amyloid aside for a second. All neuropathies have a higher risk of what we call entrapment neuropathies, because we think of, okay, if you're nervous sick to begin with, anything that happens to it, it's not gonna recover as well. So that's why patients with inherited neuropathies also tend to do worse with chemotherapy that is known to cause neuropathy, um, as well as you know carpal tunnel, things like that. Now, <clears throat> for patients with TTR, they get a double ding because not only is that abnormal protein in the nerve, but it's also on all the ligaments and tendons around that nerve. So that's why they are very highly prone to carpal tunnel. But, but all neuropathies, unfortunately, we call that almost like a double crush, meaning it's like a one-two hit. Like, okay, your nerve wasn't great, and then you had something happen to it. So it's going to respond a little slower and not heal as fast as somebody who had a normal nerve to begin with. That makes sense. Emily, did you have anything you had to add on that? Okay. Um, okay. Well, that's helpful. And I feel like, again, I, I think just in general, a lot of these questions are best also being asked to your own particular PCP or specialist or neurologist, um, because everyone is very different. Um, so I just want to remind everyone to kind of take some of these facts and resources and um, follow up directly with your own personal care provider. Um, so, you know, when patients are told that they have a variant of uncertain significance, they're not really sure what to do about that. And how do you recommend them following up, right? I mean, do, do they ask more questions? Do they get more genetic tests? Um, do they see different specialists? A again, really, what's a, what's a patient supposed to do with this information? And this is actually a question that I'm very interested in as well because they reach out to us at the organization to, to learn more about it. And this is one tricky, tricky question. So um, which which one of you are, are brave enough to, to, to answer? <laughs> I can start and then Dr. Peltier can jump in. Um, first thing I would recommend is they see a specialist, whether that's a genetics professional or neurologist that has expertise in the genetics. Um, because sometimes depending on the gene, even though the lab classifies it as a VUS or variant of uncertain significance, we can give our best educated guess on which way it's leaning. Okay. Um, and so th that can help clarify some of the ambiguity. Um, in general, we don't typically recommend making medical management decisions based off of VUS. It's more based on what symptoms and signs a patient's experiencing. That makes sense. Dr. Pelty, anything in addition? So, so when we do genetic testing, you know, so what I typically look at those variants is, does those variants fit with a gene that matches what that patient has? So, so the downside of doing a big panel is that you're gonna have genes that are cause neuropathy, but are totally different than what the patient has. So if the patient has, and especially it also depends on if that gene is typically passed on as autosomal recessive and they only have one copy, so then it's really less likely that that's really a problem or it's dominant. Um, so I look at the individual variants and say, okay, how likely are these to be related to what my patient has? And if I say, ah, that's in a recessive, you know, disorder, and that looks totally different than what this patient has. I just tell them those variants are not, I'm not worried about them. And, and I just say your test is normal. If there are variants that I'm worried about, like that there are genes that I think could actually be causative, then, um, then what I typically do is then involve our counselors and our genetics 
team because they can look at the variants and say, because one of the things we look at with a change in gene is that um, you can have a change in the gene sequence that doesn't actually cause a change in the way the protein is made or functions. And those variants are less likely to be a problem then, and that's something that geneticists can do, or they can lip, lip, there's things that they can do that is beyond my scope. <laughs> and then the other thing they can do is if there's also a concern that it's a disease causing variant, they can also test other family members and say, okay, well, if your sister, brother, whatever has no symptoms and they also kind of have that variant, then it's like, yeah, it's probably less likely to be an issue. Um, but so, so it all depends on what genes the variants in, and that's where I always agree. You know, having somebody who's ordering the testing, who knows what those genes are, or what types of neuropathies those genes typically cause, is um, more helpful. Okay. Well, that that's an amazing answer, and appropriately wraps up our session. Um, so thank you both so much for your expertise. Um, apologies to all of the folks that asked questions that we were unable to get to. We'll try our best to follow up after this program, but obviously this will continue to be a resource on our website for the, for the fu foreseeable future. Um, so everyone, thank you again for watching. Um, and another thank you to our sponsor, Elnylam Pharmaceuticals, for sponsoring this program and for sharing this information with our population. So. As always, um, the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy welcomes advice and input on how we're doing with our educational programs such as this one. So please take the survey, let us know what we're doing great at, what we can improve on, um, continue supporting us and being a part of our lovely organization. We so appreciate it and it allows us to keep these programs going um, for patients like you that are really interested and keen on keen on learning. Um, so thank you again, everyone, Dr. Peltier, Emily, you both have been amazing. I'm so thankful for both of you. And um, thank you to everyone watching today. All right. Thank have you. a great day, everyone. Thank you again. Bye-bye.